Hi, and welcome back to the second hour of this Monday edition of Focal Point on AFR Talk. Brian Fisher is my name. Number to call if you want to join the program, 888-589-8840. Number to call, 888-589-8840. Fascinating article that I read from uh, Ben Voth at the Southern Methodist University and the connection between Christianity and the Civil Rights Movement, Christianity and Martin Luther G- uh, King Jr.'s great speech, I Have a Dream, where he actually weaves prophetic passages from Amos and from Isaiah right into his great speech. And Voth's point is that without Christianity, there would have been no civil rights movement. If we'd had the, 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 the myth of the separation of church and state, which is prominent in so many parts of our political culture today, you never would have had the civil rights movement because Christianity would never have been allowed to speak to issues of civil rights. So if you'd like to weigh in on all of this, uh, you know, what, what Voth is saying, look, back in the 1990s, you know, and maybe the, the question would be, what do you think the implications are of this biblical illiteracy that we have today? This is Voth's point, is up until the 1990s, you would study a great speech in history and you would look for the allusions to biblical themes, and they stopped doing that in the 1990s because students were completely unfamiliar with the great themes and stories of the scripture. So the question would be, what implications do you see of our biblical um, illiteracy? Now, I want to play a couple of other sound bites. Um, I want to go to clips five and six. This is Raul Labrador. He is from my home state of Idaho, a staunch conservative. He is an American citizen by birth. He was born in Puerto Rico, which was an American territory, United States territory. So therefore, he is a citizen by birth. And he was on a panel yesterday. I believe this was on CNN. He was on a panel yesterday, and everybody was gloom and doom and despair and uh, bleakness about how far we were from realizing the dream of Martin Luther King Jr. You know, and everybody that I hear talking about this are always talking about how far we are from realizing the dream and how much work we have to do and how little progress we've made. And before I get to those Rail Labrador clips, here is a excerpt from a piece by Joshua Dubois or Joshua Dubois. I'm not sure how you say his last name. He was President Obama's first director of the White House faith-based initiative, and I think he still sends to President Obama, a Bible verse uh, every day for him to to mull over. And he himself is uh, in, in the ministry, or was in the ministry, was, uh, was ordained and was active in the ministry before he went to work for the Obama White House. And he writes about this, and he's black, he writes about the fact that everybody's saying, when are we going to get there, why haven't we got there? And here he, uh, and he responds to, to this. My first instinct has always been to answer that open-ended inquiry, when are we going to get there, to where Martin Luther King Jr. pointed us, with my first instinct is to respond with an equally squishy response, one that we will hear again and again from politicians, preachers, and activists during the next week, quote, we've come so far, but we have so much further to go. End quote. I've said this line myself as recently as this past Wednesday in the pulpit of a black Baptist church. It's a phrase that sounds practical, realistic, and even useful, but the problem is I think it's wrong, and more than just wrong, it is perhaps the primary barrier to real racial progress in this nation. Instead of being in a state of perpetual struggle, an endless existential march, I believe there is far more evidence to support the idea that we are right on the verge of Zion. We're right on the verge of getting to where Martin Luther King Jr. pointed us. And the only thing that will stop us from getting there is the hopeless belief that we can't. And by the way, I want to suggest to you that a lot of those in the in the race-mongering community They have a vested interest in keeping racial division alive. It it is their calling card. It's their reason for existence. They do not want racial reconciliation in America. They don't want these racial divides overcome. They don't want barriers crossed. They don't want bridges built. They want to continue to have racial agitation because that's their meal ticket. They raise money 
off of that. That's their only reason for existence. And so they have a vested interest in fighting uh, racial reconciliation. And therefore, they're the ones that are stirring up this hopeless belief that we can't get to the place that Martin Luther King Jr. pointed us to. For example, in the early, and he says we're closer than you might think. In the early 1970s, following the major accomplishments of the civil rights movement, 28% of black men dropped out of high school. Today, that number is around 14%. For whites, it's 12%. So we're closing that gap. Four decades ago, the life expectancy for African Americans was 66. Today, it is 72. And for whites, the number is 77. So again, he says, look, we are closing uh, the gap. The goals he talks about uh, for racial reconciliation, for parity between the white community and black community, these goals are eminently achievable. And organizations and, and activists around the country are helping us walk the last mile. They are not on some perpetual march to Zion they're focused on achieving dignity and self-determination for every struggling person in this country, in this generation, right here, right now. On this 50th anniversary, we should march knowing that we have certainly have not yet fulfilled Dr. King's dream. But what if, instead of seeing this land as thousands of miles off in the distance, we perceived it as being right in front of us, begging us to walk toward it and enter. Hey, maybe we're even standing on it right now, and all we need to do is bend down and till the soil. Now, with that as a backdrop, we'll just have time for this first Raul Labrador clip. We'll play the second one coming out of the break. But Raul Labrador on this panel on race issues, and he, he, he is he's frustrated, agitated with his fellow panelists for their gloom and doom. Here is clip number one. It saddens me actually to hear some of the things that I'm hearing here because I think the American dream is alive. I was born four years after the March on Washington. I was born to a single mother who lost her job because she, was, she was, got pregnant by me, who decided to give me life, but the most important thing that she decided is that she was going to give me a good life. I didn't go to military school when I was a young man because my mother was rich. I went to military school because she decided to sacrifice. She decided to go without some things in her life so she could put me in a military school. Then she couldn't afford that anymore, so she put me in another private school. And eventually, when she wanted to move to the mainland, she decided to put me in a bilingual school because she thought that the only way I would be successful in life is by gaining an education, by being better educated, by learning English. So Raul Lobador is saying, look, we, we've come a lot further than most people are willing to acknowledge. I am a living example of the American dream. It is still attainable. I was born four years after the Civil Rights Movement, and yet my mother gave me life, so it makes a strong sanctity of life statement. She wanted me to go to good education. She wanted me to learn English so that I could be successful in this culture. And here I am today, a sitting United States Congressman. American Dream is alive.